Okay. So before getting started, started just for those of um, you who are part of the C21 community or the UWM community, a reminder that uh, we do have another event on Friday at 3 p.m. Central. Uh, Dean Spade will give a talk with the Villas Trust sponsored Women and Gender Studies Feminist Lecture Series. Again, that's Friday at three, and uh, that will sum up and finish off our programming for this week. Um, this week is also the last week to uh, participate and share your stories in our Lonely No More survey, which is part of the new structure of the Center for the 21st First century studies uh, programming um, with, with the center this year. So to learn more about Lonely No More, to access that survey, to register for the Dean Spade talk, and just to learn more and also access this recording later, what I'm going to do is just put our website uh, link in the chat right now. And all that information will be there, including a link to uh, Nigel's podcast uh, episode that he had with me, which is a little intro uh, intro to this particular book launch event. So without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing Nigel Rothfels, uh, who is a historian of animals and culture. After completing his PhD at Harvard in 1994, he started his career at UWM as an editorial assistant here <laughs> at what was then called the Center for 20th Century Studies. So while working in a series of positions here at UWM, his research and writing explored many different aspects of human-animal interactions in history. He is the author of Savages and Beasts, which I have here, The Birth of the Modern Zoo, that was published in 2002 as the second volume in the seminal book series in John Hopkins University Press's Animals, History, and Culture series, edited by Harriet Ritfo, who I believe is in the audience today. Um, also in 2002, Rothfels edited Representing Animals, a multidisciplinary study of animals and culture that grew out of a conference by the same title hosted by this center in the spring of 2000. The collection has been one of the most successful titles published through the center and continues now 20 years later to impact the field. Nigel has held research fellowships from among others, Princeton University, the National Endowment of the Humanities and the Humanities Research Center in Canberra. Canberra. And he is currently the professor and chair of the Department of History here at UWM and also the director of our Office of Undergraduate Research. So um, if we could <laughs> applaud Nigel in all of these efforts and to celebrate today, his most recent book, Yay. Elephant Trails. <laughs> I, if you're just popping in, I'm Nicole Welk Yeager, Deputy Director of the Center for 21st Century Studies. And I am also in the animal history world. Oh, if you have animals, bring them to the camera, of course. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Harry, for the chat. Um, and I am just delighted to have, what we're gonna have is a, a book conversation. Uh, Nigel and I just talking about the book and, and riffing a bit here. So I, um, without further ado, Nigel, my first question to you, and just to start everything off in this conversation is, how did you get to this book? How did you get from Savage Beats, Beast to Elephant Trails? Um, well, uh, so you'll forgive me, uh, those of you who, oh, look at the people holding up the books. Um, so you'll forgive me if, if I get uh, at all emotional here, because when I look at this group of people, <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, my path is uh, connected to so many of you. Um, and um, I, uh, this, is, this is actually just a tad overwhelming. It's actually kind of one of the cool things maybe about Zoom um, is that we can do something like this, which we haven't been able to do um, uh, before the the, this catastrophe. So um, it is lovely to see you. And when I think about the origins of, of the book, um, you know, it's the classic problem. When do, when do you start? There are books, there are elephants in this book that go to my childhood. Um, there is an elephant in this book who is, who starts with the letter A, Alice, uh, who, so she's early in the index. There's about 45 elephants in this index, as far as I know. Um, Alice is one of my first elephants in my life. Uh, when I was a child and visiting the Hogel Zoo uh, in Salt Lake City. Um, 
there's an elephant in here that starts with Z, uh, Ziggy, who uh, lived in Chicago um, and is also um, a part of my experience in, in my world. And then there's like, so maybe it starts with Alice. Um, maybe it starts uh, with uh, conversations that I've had with lots of you over the years. Um, I think I, I say in the book that there is a, a particular photograph that started it for me that I probably, well, that I found in probably my very first year of dissertation research. Uh, so this is going back uh, more than 30 years ago. Um, uh, and it's a photograph of a little elephant who uh, was called Jumbo in the, in the book, but was also eventually called Toto who uh, uh, lived uh, most of its life at the Rome Zoo. And there's a photograph of Jumbo in the first book I wrote, uh, uh, the Savages and Beasts book of this little elephant. Uh, and behind it in the photograph is its dead mother. Uh, and it's a rather unusual photograph because it's actually a photograph of this animal before it had entered into captivity, sort of at that moment when, uh, just before it was captured. Um, I used that photograph in my first book uh, in, a, uh, in a chapter about the exotic animal trade. And I have been vexed by that photo for a very long time. Um, and I decided not to use it in this book, um, even though I know that uh, that particular elephant story is very much a part of what this whole book was about. Um, trying to figure out whether I could write a story about that particular elephant probably led me to uh, figure out whether I could just write um, a story that's much bigger than that, because I think that whole moment of that elephant being captured and then its transport to Germany and eventually to Rome and its eventual death in Rome and its afterlife, one should say, uh, in, at the Natural History Museum um, in Rome, uh, is maybe the story I wanted to write, um, but I didn't use the photograph because I consider it um, such an incredibly traumatic photograph. Um, and uh, so that was an issue for me uh, for the book. Um, and also why I'm contemplating um, actually doing a revision of the first book and, and rethinking some of those decisions I made a long time ago. And Harriet's like, oh my God. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, so, so I don't know where it starts. I think it definitely started with that. And then it started with a fellowship I had in Canberra uh, to write um, something about elephants in the 18th century. Um, and that was the sort of first steps in, in the project. And then it ends with another conversation with Harriet um, 20 years after we had a conversation for the first book uh, and trying to figure out whether she thought she might like to have another book of mine in her series. And I'm happy to say she did. Um, and so, um, so there's lots of starting points, I guess, uh, for like all of us in all of our work. Is that an answer? It is. I think it is an answer. <laughs> and I remember when we were doing our audio recording earlier this month that one of the things you said is this book is about real walking elephants as well as elephants we just think about. And I think that that's um, it, it's incredible to also see the elephants in this book and how you talked about their images that you you were hesitant to put in here that you thought thoughtfully about what what pieces go in here and what don't. Um, and if you haven't got the book in your hands, just flipping through it, it is an incredible resource of primary resources, photographs of elephants um, in various different time periods at very di various different places. So I thought that it might be nice to do a, a deep look and a deep dive at some of these absolutely incredible photographs that are okay. part of this uh, part of this book. I'm so, glad about that idea. Please do, <laughs> <laughs> because um, oh, cool. Okay, you've got them organized. I do. I I, I do have them organized and um, thought that we could. So for. For those who don't know me, I have an art history background and I love doing visual thinking strategies. If you look at something deeply, what's happening here? What do you see that makes you say that? What more can you find? And I think it would just be lovely, Nigel, if we talked about some of these, uh, these images that you chose for the book and how you got to them and what's happening here and 
how you're dissecting them uh, for the purposes of your, well, your story. So um, I think if, if people have looked at my work before, um, I often, I think I almost always start with an image uh, that, that perplexes me in some way. Um, and, and, uh, and this is the, the first image so the first image in the book, I think it's the first image in the book, maybe on the, like the first or second page of the book. Um, it's a photograph that I first saw when I was doing research for my, uh, for my first book uh, at, the, um, at the Bronx Zoo's archive. Um, and then I have to say, I I, it's stuck in my brain and stuck in my brain. And um, and I didn't use it. And then when I was writing this book, I was like, where the hell is that picture? And I could not, I could remember seeing it. I could totally visualize it, but I could not remember where it was. I had convinced myself it was in Radcliffe's collection um, because the woman in the picture is Helen Keller. Um, and so I had decided that. And so I spent so much time like looking at Radcliffe's collection thinking it must be here somewhere. Um, but I completely forgot that it was at the Bronx Zoo. Um, and then Madeline Thompson, who uh, was the archivist at, at the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, who publishes a blog of cool things that she finds uh, or found at that time uh, in, the, in their collection, uh, published this on her blog. And I was like, oh my God, it's the picture. Um, so right, it's a, it's a photograph of Helen Keller uh, visiting the Bronx Zoo um, with her nieces. Um, uh, early 1920s, if I remember, um, the Alice, this is another elephant named Alice, a different Alice, um, not the Princess Alice who came to Utah, but another Alice, and actually they were on the same shipment uh, that came from Hagenbeck um, uh, to, the, to the United States. Uh, she was originally at the Coney Island Zoo, uh, excuse me, the Coney Island Amusement Park, and then was brought out to the Bronx Zoo as a ride elephant because they needed they wanted to have rides at the zoo. And so there's actually a couple more pictures of Keller at the zoo that day um, um, of her on top of the elephant. And right, so the point of the photograph, the intriguing part of the photograph, the maybe the reason that the photograph was taken is because of the very, very, very old story of the blind men and the elephant, um, which is also the cover um, of the book, um, which is a story that goes back to the Buddha uh, about the limits of knowledge um, in a way. Um, and the story is just uh, that uh, a king brought uh, the blind men of a village um, before an elephant and they all touched a different part of the elephant. And when he asked them uh, what an elephant was, they all gave a different answer. Um, and that story gets sort of repeated now for, uh, <laughs> um, more than a few thousand years. Uh, so uh, it's been around. And um, I, um, well, let's put it this way, uh, more than 2000 years. Um, and, I, um, uh, and I think that that's part of why this photograph was taken of Hel Helen Keller uh, uh, touching this elephant named Alice. Um, I was interested in it for that gesture, uh, but I was also interested in it because you can see the, uh, the riding saddle on Alice's back. Um, and you can uh, see the um, sculpture by uh, uh, Mr. Proctor on the building, uh, which, uh, and you can see the building itself, which was when it was built in 19, oh gosh, 1908, I think is when it opened, um, was considered the most beautiful zoological building ever built. It's the elephant building, which is on the central axis of the Bronx Zoo. The claim was that it would be used by the zoo for hundreds of years. Um, I can say it's still used by the uh, Bronx Zoo, but not for elephants. Uh, it, is, uh, it is just a building that is used for a variety of other purposes, but no longer for elephants. Um, so the, the picture captured for me this central problem of the book, which is that um, we always only ever see a small part of an elephant. Um, and, uh, and part of that has to do with our historical position and time. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the Buddha's uh, solution to the problem of the, the, the blind man and the elephant is that they're all telling a part of the truth. 
um, they're not telling the whole truth. And so any religion can only tell you a part of a greater truth, but not the whole truth. So um, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the limited nature of our interaction with the world and our ability to, uh, to see it is used uh, in that parable. It's an important parable. And, um, and so uh, I, it, it becomes sort of a thread throughout the book um, about um, our inability to see the elephant even today. So, right, I, I'm glad you pointed out that the book is about real elephants and also the elephants that are in our brains. The elephants, I say, that whose natural habitat is the mind, the human mind. Um, uh, it is a combination. Um, and so uh, I think some people have worried whether uh, animal studies is too much about what we think about elephants versus or animals versus the animals themselves. Personally, I've always tried to sort of um, blend the two. And I think that's what I'm trying to do here. I can tell you all about Alice, but I hope I can also tell you something about why that picture exists. How's that? Does that work? Oh, yeah. It's give me a, another picture. Give me another one. Yeah, I'll give you another. Um, this one here. Forgive oh. the, the little bit of blurriness here. But, yeah, um, so it's a, that's a great picture. Um, uh, Gary Marvin, who is in the audience here today, uh, I happened to be in England or I, on the occasion of Gary Marvin's um, beatification, which is to say his becoming a professor, if I remember uh, his elevation, um, there was, um, I, I spent some time at the Natural History Museum, um, the London Natural History Museum of London's uh, storage collection in Wandsworth um, on the, in sort of South London. Uh, it's a large um, uh, uh, warehouse really uh, that where the where the where the dry collections of the natural history museum are stored things that are not on exhibit um, you have to imagine just large uh, rooms uh, with very bright light uh, when the lights are on um, and um, uh, and uh, tens of thousands of animals really and I had asked to come and take photographs of the elephant collection um, uh, basically I want but for this part of the book, I wanted to talk about elephant graveyards. Um, and so for part of that, for me, had to do with um, the bone collections in Natural History Museum. Um, this particular photograph was taken by uh, Helen Bullard, um, uh, uh, who was with me on that trip. Um, and uh, I've just loved this photograph ever since. I, you can possibly just make out uh, that the tag uh, says Eliphas Maximus. And in the bottom left corner, it says no history. Uh, and in the bottom right corner, um, I can't quite read it here, but it's just, I think it just said um, skull and skeleton. And then an accession number in the top right corner. Um, and then on the box itself, on the crate itself, you can might just be able to make out in sort of white chalk, um, sort of something that reads like fant and story, but it's actually the whole thing. It's uh, elephant, no history. And so no history here is pretty transparent that they just kind of don't know where this elephant came from. They don't know where it was collected, that is, and when, which are the key pieces of information uh, that the Natural History Museum would want. So the, the, the expression is no history. And that's a that's um, a term of art uh, in, in, the, uh, in natural history museums, um, and it is used in other collections, and I found it on other bones. As an historian, uh, it's, it's kind of like ultimate bait. Uh, how could something not have history? Um, and how could um, a collection of bones in a box in a natural history museum in London not just be overloaded uh, with history? Um, and so, um, it was just, it's just one of those things uh, where it was an opportunity for me to talk a little bit about um, what history might be uh, in the context of, um, of animals and of elephants. Um, certainly the elephant that's in this crate uh, has history um, that, that exists before its contact with humans, but its history since it was uh, shot and killed uh, has also uh, is also part of the story. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think I, there are a few images in the book where you have remains of elephants rather than the elephants themselves. And there's something really wonderful about looking at these various living and dead images of animals. Um, and this element that you talked about with the this parable in the beginning that you can't get to everything just with history you can't we weren't there we, we we don't necessarily have all of the answers to what it was like tangibly and with, just with animals it's it's always partial the the way that we're interacting the knowledge and and how much we know of that animal how much we know of that history so it's quite beautiful seeing how these two pictures uh kind of speak to uh to similar challenges that are historical humanities focused as well as I think that's on right. That. I mean, they're both they're both rich artifacts of of our thinking about things, um, uh, about animals and about elephants. Um, but in both cases, uh, there's an actual animal that was there that we can also find out about. Uh, we can find out some things about the elephant that's in this crate. Um, and, um, and there's another picture, which I don't think I saw in your selection. Um, there's an elephant bone that I found uh, actually, yes, at the Smithsonian collection in Maryland. So the, uh, the museum support center in Maryland, which again is a storage facility for the Natural History Museum on the mall in, 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 in Washington. And I was very lucky that they just sort of let me go in that space uh, with my camera um, without anybody with me. And I had, I, it, was, it was an amazing experience for me. Um, and again, I found a bone there uh, that said no history. Um, and, um, and so that's in the book as well. But then from that bone, I ended up finding many other bones and eventually the tusks of that particular elephant. And that led me sort of on this um, sort of, um, quest or maybe uh, a trail, which is the sort of metaphor I use throughout the book uh, to like find out what I could about that particular elephant. And her name was Josephine and she lived at the Philadelphia Zoo. Um, and it's, it's stunning for me to find like photographs of Josephine um, in Philadelphia uh, and then find her, you know, her, 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 um, her bones and, and tusks uh, in this collection at the Smithsonian, okay, her bones and tusks, at a collection at the, at the Smithsonian in the US um, with a label on it that says no history. When it doesn't take that much to find out an awful lot about this particular elephant, um, but it's just, you know, how things end up in our collections. Uh, and I, it's a great story about how pieces are archived, how, how artifacts are archived, what kind of artifacts we classify as having history and no history. It's a, um, and the way that you write about it in the book is, brings a, a really nice uh, flow to, to thinking about elephants and how they have these many trajectories and how mm -hmm. we place so much of what we, what we worry and care about onto them. Mm -hmm. um, and there's much to dissect from the artifacts, which leads me to this, this next image uh, where- Am images, I right? This might be our last one because- It is our last okay, image. And then All I right. do have a passage of the book we can talk about a little bit. So okay. for those of you who are, I see people tumbling in and tuning in, uh, Nigel and I are just having a conversation about some of the highlights of this book. And then we're gonna open it up for conversation. There's like 80 people here. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, okay. this is truly a celebration of the, it, this book has so much, you've done so much research and you've looked into the lives of so many different elephants and a picture can say so much or can say nothing at all. And it just is a matter of digging into these lives of these individuals, both human and animal. So I'd, I'd love for you to tell us who's in this image and the, the various different layers of the stories that can be told just from what seems to be a pretty tranquil image on its onset. Yeah, so uh, one of the things I tried to do in the book was um, uh, tell stories that maybe haven't been told before. So uh, I, I don't talk about the famous Jumbo, for example, or um, uh, other elephants that uh, have been written about a lot, 
this one is a fairly well-known elephant. Um, his name is Gunda. Uh, and this is one, I think, of the last photographs of Gunda um, before Gunda was um, shot. Um, uh, this, again, is at the Bronx Zoo, uh, 1915, um, just before, um, I think it's probably within a month or so of his death. Um, the story of Gunda and Walter Thuman, who is the uh, keeper who's there uh, with uh, Gunda, uh, occupies a whole chapter. I, um, in two chapters in the book, I wanted to do something more biographical. Um, and so I have one uh, that's really focused on this particular elephant uh, named Gunda. Uh, and it's more of a part of a larger discussion about elephants and zoos. And then there's another chapter about an elephant that most people know of as Tusco, but I tend to refer to as Ned. Um, uh, and that chapter is about uh, the circus. Um, and I found that with both the zoo topic and the circus topic, it really helped for me to anchor it uh, to a particular uh, animal to sort of talk about. Rather than talk about elephants in the circus, I wanted to talk about an elephant. Um, so yeah, this is a this is as you as you as you pointed out. Um, I I think uh, what looks like um, or what might be sort of seen as kind of a um, a calm moment uh, between this keeper and the elephant. Um, the story between these two uh, and between Gunda and the keepers and Gunda and his audience and Gunda and the facility is uh, about anger <laughs> and, um, and frustration. Um, uh, Gunda came to the Bronx Zoo uh, to be uh, uh, what the, the, the head of the zoo, William Hornaday, hoped would be a magnificent um, uh, specimen for the collection. The goal was to have a very large um, uh, male tusked Asian elephant uh, that at least for a few years might be uh, good as a ride elephant, but then would become this like, um, like the largest, grandest something, uh, you know, name your hyperbolic uh, uh, description. Um, but that was the goal uh, with Gunda. Um, Beginning in about uh, two, well, earlier on, um, uh, there were several instances in which he um, um, was violent with a keeper. Um, also, a, a, a very uh, a, a, a visitor who visited him every day. Um, uh, one day, uh, she would come with food, and she was an elderly woman. Um, and she would come to the zoo and she would feed uh, Gunda every day. And uh, a couple of times Gunda grabbed her and tried to drag her into the exhibit. And that became very problematic uh, for, the, for, the, um, for the management. Um, but then there were a couple of times where Gunda succeeded in attacking a keeper um, and sending them to the hospital. And this particular keeper uh, managed to sort of work out a relationship with Gunda that was, uh, that was quite violent. Um, is the way to describe it, um, but um, uh, and involved sort of both of them um, uh, uh, trying to assert um, their control of the situation. Um, and this is, uh, as I say, just before Gunda was shot. Um, uh, for uh, more than two years, Gunda had uh, been chained by one foot, uh, one front foot and one back foot uh, to a wall because they couldn't uh, trust um, him not to attack the keepers or others. And the public would come and they would also taunt him and pretend to throw him food and various other th things to try to get him into a rage. I, I really feel that um, there, was, there were lots of mistakes that, that one could have imagined have, uh, as having been made. Um, but I also feel that in this case, um, uh, the situation itself was just a disaster. Um, and by um, 2000, excuse me, 1913, it became a story in the New York Times that was covered and covered and covered about this poor elephant who was chained up uh, at the Bronx Zoo. Eventually, the New York Times uh, did a whole two-page spread of letters to the editor demanding that the situation for this elephant change. Um, and the zoo sort of semi-relented and not completely and then um, 
and then finally made the decision to to put Gunda down uh, as and Gunda was shot by Carl Akeley actually um, uh, uh, one day um, and that was the end of the story of Gunda uh, and um, I think uh, yeah so a picture like this um, there's a lot <laughs> that's going on in it uh, and finding out more about this particular elephant and his and his and the challenges that he faced, um, but also the context in which he was being, um, uh, the buildings that were created. This building was really about him as much as anything else. The perfect building for their perfect elephant, um, and uh, it didn't um, it didn't really work out as planned. Hmm. Oh gosh. So here's the thing. One of the things is that some, so many times I think in this book, um, uh, people are going to find it to be a, a very melancholic book. Uh, and I don't really feel that way. And I actually feel that it doesn't necessarily always work in that register, but as a writer, um, to find the tone that works right for the for the topic without being just you know modeling or something right but to but to uh, to try to be honest about the experiences of the people uh, and not use this as some kind of platform that's like anti fill in the blank um, which is which is not what I do um, uh, uh, is uh, presented some interesting challenges for me but I think I think. I hope I, I hope I got it right. I think one of the things that's that the book does really well is bring those melancholic moments and stories by bringing them into their context. We kind of get to understand a little bit more about human elephant engagements and relationships and how they've changed over time, how they've been reevaluated over time, especially as we gain more knowledge and understanding. Of, of creatures like elephants. And um, I see the writing is very, um, it, is very compassionate. And <laughs> it actually uh, is a, a decent segue to me just kind of ending our little conversation here about the writing and just pulling up a, a passage from the book itself and just reading it out loud and getting a sense oh, of- Bless you for reading it because I can't <laughs> read. I'll read it and it's a passage, um, it's actually towards the end and I think kind of circles and encompasses the argumentation that you're oh really my. trying to pull out or okay. at least I hope so. And with my- um, I think every word in this book is so <laughs> perfectly chosen that you could almost choose any passage, but go ahead. <laughs> All right, Nigel, it's on page 188. 188. So, 188 if anyone has their book. I have my but book. But the paragraph goes, this book uh -huh. does not answer the question of why we are so interested in elephants. Carl Jung seems to have had some thoughts on this matter, but I don't know if we will really ever know. Um, perhaps the answer has something to do with their size, grayness, wrinkles, or faces. Our minds might be hardwired in a way that makes us pay attention to large, potentially dangerous and mysterious creatures like elephants. By becoming more aware of the elephant trails around us though, I hope we can begin to be more careful in our thinking about these animals. Statements beginning, quote, elephants are dot, 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 unquote, have started many arguments we have about elephants. In that ellipses are contained thoughts that can only be understood as coming from the speaker's particular and limited blind view of the world. We would do more good, I believe, if we were more modest in our claims about these animals. Our history of thinking about these remarkable entities should make us cautious in what we claim to know about them and what is best for them. So I wanted to ask as a, as a question that then builds out and I hope engages in a larger conversation with everyone here in the room, um, where once I'm done with this question with Nigel, you can raise your hand, ask him questions, or we can filter through the chat here. But my question is, 
we've talked a bit about what history does for us as humans and how we catalog, catalog and classify things. And we've even talked about what animals have done for us as humans and what elephants do and have been doing in our history. But what might history do for elephants in this case and talking about this passage? Uh, well, great passage. Um, uh, yeah, you have to say something at the end of the book about uh, why you wrote this dang thing. Um, I think for me, um, one of the things that historians I hope do is, um, is make people um, or ask people to be less certain about what they think they know as truth. Um, and um, and more uh, modest about um, uh, claims about what we know. Um, you know, the kind of unfortunate thing that historians maybe sometimes do is say, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and, um, uh, but I think in the case of his uh, elephants, um, uh, I wish that people um, would not think that their own view they're what I would call their uh, fairly um, uh, limited view of what an animal might be or is or what a particular elephant is uh, for me um, uh, is somehow comprehensive. It's, it is only, it's only a small part of the story. Um, and my book is so, you know, it's called Elephant Trails. Um, for me, a trail is is partly uh, uh, about what historians do in terms of um, finding a bit of the past and, and following to see where it goes. Um, there's a reference, and I see uh, Sabina Gross and uh, Marcus Bullock in the audience. I, I, I know I've talked to Sabina about Brecht before because there's this line in, in Brecht um, about uh, the paths that elephant leads. Uh, that leave uh, the paths that an elephant leaves or elephants leave behind them. Um, and um, so that has always kind of interested me um, uh, uh, about the, the, the sort of historical traces that are, you know, that are all around us about elephants. Um, and um, so I, I guess I just, I wish uh, that um, uh, people who are engaged in um, debates about elephants today um, would uh, be a bit more cautious in what they think they know. Um, you know, I see uh, Dick Blau also here, and Dick and I uh, did this book a few years ago. As part of this kind of project, it was a little bit of a spin-off project about elephants uh, in a zoo in Oregon. And this is another elephant who is in the book um, and an elephant that Dick and I had the privilege to spend a little time with um, and an elephant that um, has been very important to me um, named Packy, the only Packy. There may be hundreds of elephants named Alice, but there's only one Packy. Um, and, um, and so we got to spend some time with Packy. Um, and I think that Dick and I may have had lots of ideas about what we thought that experience might look like and, and, and what, um, the life of elephants might be uh, in a zoo um, in this particular case. And we learned a great deal. Um, I also see that um, Bess Frank was in this list somewhere. Uh, and um, uh, Bess and I have had many, many conversations, uh, especially early on in this project about elephants and zoos, uh, because Bess spent her whole professional career working in zoos. Uh, <clears throat> and um, and was a really great uh, guide for me uh, in this project as well. And so, yeah, I mean, for me, it's like uh, there's there are really beautiful and uh, poignant stories to tell uh, when when you start down a road like this. And and they're for me about the people. They're also about the animals, and they're also about the animals that I that are simply just made up animals that that I'm also kind of fascinated with as well. So yes, there are lots of elephants in here that are just fantasies. So, okay, I think I'll stop. <sighs> I can go on too, too long. And, we're, and we promised that we would have at least sort of 20 minutes at the end uh, in case anyone had 
anything they wanted to ask. Yeah, and we're we're at that 20 minute mark and we we just wanted this to be informal, colloquial, collegial um, in the celebration of this terrific book. Final yeah, you know, you know how you go to these things and you can't see the people. I I I I it's like I just like to see the people because uh, so because you're all nice people. Well, if anyone has any questions uh, or comments or or just just to, uh, to to start the conversation, if you just want to raise your hand and then I'll I'll call on you, ask you to end mic, and we can uh, start some questions. I do see some uh, some points and and comments in the chat here. Um, Jane Desmond speaking to a beautiful oh, poet. Jane. Uh, relationship between representation, the real and the representational of the animal. Um, Gary Marvin at the museum I'm working with, we're trying to recover those individuals apart from the collection uh -huh. uh, that you were referred, referring to Nigel. And then with Gunda and that image that we had showed earlier seems to only have one task. Is there a story there? Did you uncover that story? So oh yeah, hi Beth. Um, oh, those are all good. I mean, uh, the, uh, this is the the quick story about Gunda is he was shattering his tusks all the time, um, uh, mostly by uh, running to a wall um, and um, breaking off bits and pieces, and that's just uh, you know where it was at that point. Uh, there had been a big chunk that broke off um, in uh, about a year before that. Uh, so um, you know I mentioned that I talk about an elephant named uh, Tusco. Tusco had um, was maybe not surprisingly known for his tusk. Um, uh, but if you find photographs of Tusco in his later years, they're just nubs um, because he, um, he broke them off uh, in, in his enclosures. So, oh, wow, I didn't know that about Gunda. Uh, thank you. Uh, I did not know that. Um, so the, the name, um, um uh was the name that uh, gunda came to the bronx zoo with that name uh, from hagenbeck um and hagenbeck told a whole backstory about uh where gunda was captured um uh, uh and the and his experiences um i've worked enough with hagenbeck not to believe a, um not to believe everything, shall we say, that, that, that he wrote in his letters, um, because most all his letters were also efforts to market the animal in one way or another. Um, so all kinds of claims got made about, um, about animals, but I never, I, I didn't know that about um, um, that particular name. Um, it, might, um, it might actually uh, explain some things about the early history of that elephant. Okay, so we can all do that then. You can tell me where I where I miss stuff. Oh, that was actually one of my favorite parts of the book. So there's right in the last few pages. Um, thanks, Teresa. Uh, in the last few pages, I um, I talk about a story from Eileen. Um, So in his natural history um, from what is it, third century A.D. or so, um, he's got a passage about elephants, and he says something to the effect that, you know, um, if I, um, you know, if I uh, neglected to tell some important story about an elephant, someone will point out that I did so only out of my ignorance. Um, and um, uh, so um, it turns out with elephants that uh, um, everything I say is such a small piece. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it's always been that case. I'm also seeing in the, the chat here a, a question by Teresa Mangum. Um, look forward to reading. Wonder if you talk about the removal of zoo elephants to sanctuaries and did that provide any solutions? Oh, Teresa. Um, so I don't actually talk too much about sanctuaries. Um, I mentioned them. Um, uh, in the U.S., the two prominent ones that we would talk about are the Performing Animal Welfare Society Sanctuary in uh, California and the Elephant Sanctuary in uh, Tennessee. Um, um, I find them uh, to be um, uh, 
um, a challenge in so many ways because the, the, the rhetoric surrounding them is very, very compelling. Often the facilities are very, very compelling. Um, I know I've had conversations with people about the facilities, for example, in California, the Formula and Welfare Society, the ARC 2000. Just on the surface of looking at those facilities, you have to kind of go, wow, that's, uh, they got, they got, they, they've done some things that, that are pretty impressive here. Um, the claims though that are being made about the kind of care being um, sort of, um, you know, somehow categorically different from what one would find in other kinds of captive situations, I often find a bit um, stretched. Um, uh, and I think that some of the things that the sanctuaries, at least those two sanctuaries, um, can offer, some elephants are real and some of it not so real. I mean, one of the, again, one of the starting points of this whole book, as, um, as Bess will know, um, was an elephant from, um, from Milwaukee, uh, who I don't talk about in the book. I don't talk about Loda, um, and um, partly because, um, well, for lots of good reasons, um, but, um, but the end of Loda's life took, uh, a, 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 was eventually at the elephant sanctuary in Tennessee, uh, but she, uh, her sort of her public uh, life really sort of started here in Milwaukee uh, and then her transfer to um, a uh, circus training uh, facility and then eventually to a sanctuary. That particular story I think is a really um, uh, sort of emblematic, the way that that particular story has been imagined and told and told and the way that uh, uh, certain groups have used it uh, um, for uh, political purposes is something that uh, I think is really, really important, but it's not something that I do in this book. That's my way of saying, Teresa, I don't know if I want to go there. Um, you know, mostly um, I consider myself a, a kind of, um, you know, late 19th, early 20th century historian. Um, there are points in this, especially around uh, elephants and cognition, the mirror recognition test, all that I, I have to put in here. I have to talk about Happy, um, the elephant at the at the Bronx Zoo, who um, is the only elephant that ever sort of solved the the, the mirror recognition test. Um, so I do, um, uh, but I don't necessarily talk about Happy in the way that other people are talking about Happy, which has to do with uh, Happy's legal rights uh, to um, in, in court. We have a, a question from Kara, if you would like to unmute and ask. Who's asking yeah. me, Kara? Hi, Thank Kara. You. Hi, how are you, Nigel? <laughs> I don't think um, we've ever met, but anyway. <laughs> I know, like, in, I think maybe in person at a conference once, but we've yeah. communicated, yeah. But um, yeah, I'm really, really excited to read the book. Um, I'm thinking back to a claim that I found really, really compelling from Savages and Beasts about, you talk about like the look of the animal in the zoo and that way that we simultaneously want the animal to look back. And then when it does, it kind of ruins the whole yeah. edifice of the zoo and the idea that what we're seeing is, is something natural. Um, and I'm kind of interested in that what seems to be like the tension between that and how we think about elephants and zoos a lot because they tend so often to be much more like individuated you know they're all named mm -hmm. they have these histories they have saddles put on them right <laughs> um so there's sort of not a similar attempt to naturalize their presence in the zoo um i don't know i'm just wondering if you can speak to that tension at all well first of all uh Wow, nice reading of Savages and Beasts. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, but um, I ended up writing a chapter on elephant eyes um, in the book uh, because I think the eyes are sort of particularly important. Um, and the way that people have found um, in the look of an elephant something really deeply powerful. Um, uh, so, and one should say, you know, fairly quickly, which I, I probably should have earlier. I really am a, a Western historian. Um, and so I don't really talk very much about um, uh, elephants in their range countries at all in this particular case. So, you know, just 
always bear in mind, you know, Nigel is pretty much a European historian. Um, but um, uh, I think I think there are particular animals at the zoo that challenge um, the visitor in different kinds of ways. Um, uh, Right. So, what are they? Um, primates, elephants, <laughs> uh, possibly cetaceans, um, and um, uh, that are complex in ways for visitors that other animals aren't. Um, uh, and that definitely has to do, at least in part, with the look um, that that people experience with those animals at the zoo. Um, and I think that you know, if one, if one, you know, uh, again, it's it's it, it's it's. You know, it's crazy having Beth here in the room too, because uh, you know, um, you know, we've we've talked about um, uh, Samson, uh, the gorilla at the um, at the Milwaukee Zoo, um, and the way that the public interacted with Samson. Again, so much I think Beth actually similar to the way that um, uh, people reacted with Gunda, this like this, this this desire to see the fury at some level, right? To see him like crash against the glass, I think was at least sort of part of what the public asked for in those exhibits. And 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 that's something that the zoo itself, I think, kind of struggles to manage. But there are certain animals at the zoo um, uh, that I think you're right, uh, pose a different kind of challenge for, for the visitor and, and, uh, and the institution. And, and this is clearly one, but yeah, cool. Do more of that people. Seeing a, another question in the chat. Winston asks a question. Yeah, <laughs> I look forward to reading. Seeing yeah. what you say about George Orwell shooting the elephant, how does your work relate to current debates to decolonize museums, especially in Germany? Wow. Okay. Uh, thanks, Winston. Um, first of all, I should say, I think the first thing I said to Dick is, have you ever considered shooting an elephant uh, as a photographer? Uh, and, <laughs> and then I think uh, we discussed that essay. Um, right. So. Um, those of you who haven't read Orwell's essay, um, Shooting an Elephant, um, it may be about how difficult it is to kill an elephant, um, uh, which is to say it's obviously not that. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's something about the experience of the colonizer uh, in colonized um, areas and the relationship between the colonizer um, and local people. Um, and it's told uh, through the experiences of, um, uh, it's an expository piece, but told through the experiences of a, um, a, a young um, uh, policeman who has been uh, dispatched to shoot an elephant that had uh, gone on a rampage. Um, and uh, um, right, so Winston's point about uh, sort of decolonization efforts um, uh, and museums, um, that is uh, sort of a big piece for me in um, the Savages and Beasts book, actually. So Savages and Beasts was published in 2002. And the distance that has been traveled since over the last 20 years uh, with uh, museums, especially in Europe, um, in Germany, around uh, the repatriation of, um, of um, material um, uh, and images and all kinds of stuff in, in uh, museums has really moved me. Um, and uh, some of you, if, you, if you've read Savages and Beasts, um, will have known, noticed that there's some images in there that I think, um, uh, I, think I, I, I genuinely ref, um, uh, am disappointed that I ended up using. Um, and, I, and I think there's an opportunity uh, to, uh, to rethink how some animals and some images uh, and some people uh, get um, used by historians for, um, for spectacle. Uh, and that's not something that I want to do at this point in my career. I feel like I know why I did it then. And I, and I told myself things like, well, it's important for people to see how bad things really were. 
Um, but at this point in my career and in my life, I don't want that kind of uh, piling on of, of, um, of damage on top of damage. So for me to, um, to have a book that out there where I um, have images in it that I, that I don't think should um, be, uh, where I don't sufficiently at least problematize um, what, what is it to use a photograph of somebody who is the grandparent or a great grandparent of somebody and for me to use that image as if it's just, you know, um, of historical interest, because <laughs> um, it's it's it has to be more than that. Um, and so um, so anyway, uh, Winston, uh, uh, thank you for the question. I um, uh, um, I I hope very much that um, that my work these days and going forward will be part of trying to make a, a few things better <laughs> rather than just like showing uh, how things suck. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'm seeing a lot of great comments in the in the chat, but this one question came through, why look at elephants uh, from 2005? And it's by answer, answering that elephants easy Visibility poses questions regarding animals in their most dramatic form. Has your approach to elephants changed over the years? What are some of the major questions about human-animal relations that elephants make visible for you in this well, latest project? Well, thank you for the lovely question. Um, it's a bit, to be honest, I feel that the answer that I used in that essay that, you know, which is essentially why do we look at elephants because they're easy to see, um, <laughs> is it was a bit of a kind of, um, oh, you know, Nigel being silly at some level um, and, and stating the obvious that may not be quite so obvious. Um, and so I think that that was um, what that was about. Um, certainly have my ideas about what elephants can help us understand uh, about human animal relations. Um, honestly, I think I picked elephants as the subject for what has been now over 20 years of work. Um, you know, when I, when I started writing this book finally uh, in 2018, I had literally just been thinking about this topic for a very, very long time. And um, I hope very much uh, that the an that the answers I've come to in this book were not the ones that I thought I knew when I started. Uh, I I believe uh, that for me at least as a writer um, and as a historian, uh, the writing is the way I find an answer to something. Um, and so there have been questions that have been circulating for me in my mind about why I have been interested in elephants. Um, some of you might know that my next project is about butterflies. Uh, and, um, and I thought I was really breaking into some great new territory for me um, until it was pointed out that I am, of course, writing about one of the largest butterflies and most beautiful butterflies that exist in the world. So there you go. It's basically Nigel doing the same thing again. He always picks the most charismatic one that he can find. Um, so. Um, not to belittle the work because I'm loving the work I'm doing, um, but um, uh, I, I, I certainly hope that, um, that my ideas about the significance of, of thinking about animals in the historical landscape have evolved a lot. I know when I teach the topic, um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking about things now that I, that I, I never thought of in the past. Uh, about animals and landscape. So that makes me happy. Thank so, you so with much, that, <laughs> this was lovely. I'm going to pause the recording.